You said computer discs to mirrors yes. and other backgrounds. So how did that come about? Well, I was in a recording studio once and a guy, a friend of mine, had um, a, 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 on a shelf had a load of, um, com- of hard disks that had had the top taken off them and they are mirrors. Um, and I thought these are absolutely beautiful. Um, and when I came, I'd had a shed full of about 50 years worth of detritus. So I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible hoarder, I couldn't throw anything away. So there's a shed full of amplifiers, uh, DVD players, CD players, computers, you name it. Um, and they, <laughs> when I came to throw them out, um, which was heartrending, because you know each one of these things represented a, a period in my life and my children's lives as well. And so I owned my boys' computers, had loads and loads of computers. So I took, when I took them out, I thought, well, I'm not going to throw away the hard disk just in case somebody nicks it. So I took the hard disks out. And then I had this great pile of hard disks. And I remembered this, you know, what they looked like. And I unscrewed the top and I laid them out and I went, that's a mirror. You know, that was the extraordinary thing. You could look in it and there's, you know, six disks, but in total, it makes up a, a mirror. And I had these old um, frames up in the attic my, from my family, They're about 200 year old frames that uh, never had anything done with it. And by complete coincidence, these six discs fit perfectly inside the frame. So I put it in the frame. I thought that's really lovely. And then that was it. I started making more, started making more, and then bought some, um, some hard disks off, you know, off eBay and, you know, bought some frames and just created different ones, different ones until I ended up with a whole wall full of these things. Is there a specific environment or material that's integral to your work? Apart from obviously we know the discs are. But a particular environment that you prefer to work in? I'm very lucky. We've got a cottage in Norfolk, and I've got a workshop there. Um, and um, I've inherited loads of tools from my father, and I've got my own. So, and I've got a, a wood lathe there that, I'm, that my brother-in-law sold me. Um, so I've taken up turning on a on a wood lathe, and it looks out over over the village pond, um, and it's pretty much my favourite place in the world, really, to be able to be in there. Looking out over the pond, making things, turning stuff on the on the, on the lake. So, uh, the, the, yeah, I'm I am as happy as Larry. And, and if I weren't an actor, that's what I'd be doing. You know, I'd be a I'd be a builder. I'd be a a, a maker of something. A creator, a carpenter, or something like that, using my hands. I get more satisfaction, you know, at the end of the day, if I've been, you know, brick laying or something in the pouring rain and you, you're tired and you're knackered and your hands are cold and b- bleeding and everything. And you look back with a pint of beer and you look and say, I did that. You know, that feeling of going, I, I did that. That's, that's better than standing on stage having a standing ovation. Where do you find inspiration? I love whatever you call it, objet trouvé, um, found stuff, you know, things that are other people's junk. I found an old gatepost. And I chopped the end off it, and I, 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 I turned it and made it into something else. But the bottom of it, there was this complete clean cut, and then it went from that into a gatepost. It must have been about 100 years old, so it got rot- more and more and more and more rotten as you went down like that. So there was this years and years of rot in this old wood that had been stuck into the ground. So again, I, I, cle- so I didn't do anything to it. I just left all the verdigris on it, but I sprayed it with the sealant. And so then that's, that sits like that. And then on the top, I French polished it. So it, was, it looks like furniture. And that sits next to the downstairs loo uh, basin. So you put your, put your um, glass on it. So it, because of wood, I love the idea. You know, if you're taking a piece of firewood, you make a choice as to whether that firewood is going to be firewood or a piece of beautiful furniture. You can make it into, you can burn it or you can make it into something. And in this, you go, that, that, that's expressing that. There's a French polished, perfectly beautiful piece of, you know, dark wood. And then actually what it is is an old gatepost, you know, and I love things like that. Do you think art fairs like Parallax are important to society? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, you know, art is. You think about, you know, an art fair represents art. And what would what would the world be without art? I mean, there are plenty of people who would say art is utterly irrelevant. You know, yes. there are people who say, you know, no, I want to sit behind my spreadsheet. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Sorry, mate. No, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Life is not numbers. I mean, conversely, there are those discs that they are all numbers on, on there. But numbers represent art. I mean, you think of music um, and MIDI, for instance. I mean, I do a lot of a lot of work with MIDI, which is the musical instrument digital interface where yes. art, music is represented by numbers. Um, but it's got to be music first. Mm. It's got to be music before it becomes. It's got to have inspiration. It's got to have feel. It's got to have something. It's a human expression of delight and beauty and extraordinariness and originality that is not just there in the day-to-day life, you know. And the same goes for plays, for drama, for 
you know, all forms of art, um, sculpture, poetry. My son's a performance poet. You know, he's disabled, but he's a performance poet. You go and see him doing his poetry. He's not disabled in the slightest bit because he's got this extraordinary ability to be able to conjure beauty out of words. That's art. So in all forms of art, um, there is an enormous importance and it's terribly worth fighting for. What two tips would you give aspiring artists wanting to exhibit at the art fair here at Parallax? Be original. Oh. That's what I'd say. Because, you know, within within art, there are, and, and it's the same. I mean, I was on Radio 6 Music the other day on Steve Lamax Round Table, and he played me a whole load of new stuff. You know, and I'm 69, and I was there listening to kids' music, and I've got two sons, age 34 and 38, and they kind of briefed me a bit about how to do it. But my, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid of the Beatles, you know. The Beatles are, are classical music, and, you know, <laughs> Steely Dan and Elton John. I mean, you, know, you name it. We've got these icons of music that we that I've got. And, and now, when I hardly ever, when I'm listening to the radio, hardly ever do I hear a new piece of music and go, "Wow!" You know, yes, I've never heard that before. You can hear it, and it's fine. Somebody has said this is commercial, and we're only going to do commercial music. We're only going to do things that people have heard before and they're comfortable with, and that is stultifying to mm. music. So, I mean, I think in everything, in all forms of art, original, originality is, is the key. You want to have something that people have gone, I've never seen that, I've never heard that, I've never thought of that before. That's what is exciting, I think. And, and hopefully my weird hard disk art, I don't think anybody else has ever done that. So what's next for Tim Benting? Um, well, I'm, I've got a lot of telly on at the moment, but I'm not allowed to tell you because I've signed, you know, <laughs> non-disclosure agreements. In the old days, I could say, oh, I'm doing this. But we, we're not allowed to do that anymore. But suffice to say, um, I've got about f for four really nice and very different parts coming up. I am allowed to leave one. I didn't um, sign a, a thing for, which is a, a movie called Hellfire, which is all about um, a boy who has survived um, a cult. Um, and I, I play this cult leader called Brother John. And he's an abusive cult leader, and he whips people, he tortures people, and brings down the fire and brimstone on your heads. And I find myself down near Swindon, up in a church, up in a pulpit, giving, wow. giving the full the full. The, oh, somebody said, "How do you? How can you do a Southern American accent?" I said, "Because I was brought up on the Beverly Hillbillies. It's my, you know, my generation. I mean, when I was a kid, that's what we listened to, and so it's ingrained in us. So that was, you know, again, something I'd never done before. And you know, I'm finding at this time of my life, I'm doing things that I've never done before, which is great, you know, because otherwise you just do the same old, same old, and then you pop it. So you don't do that. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Thank and we you. appreciate having you here at Parallax. And good luck for the future. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight and lovely to meet you.